Again, and thank you for coming. I want you to turn with me, please, if you have a Bible, to uh, the New Testament. And we're going to uh, read uh, firstly in the Gospel according to Matthew. Matthew's Gospel. And chapter number 20. Matthew's Gospel, chapter 20. I really just want to pick out a few verses, um, and you'll probably guess and follow the theme eventually, uh, if you haven't thought of it already, uh, even from our hymns. Matthew 20, and verse 28. The verse starts, even as, I really want to think of the, ver- the, the words after that. The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister, and to give his life a ransom for many. The Son of Man came not to be ministered, but to min- not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. Now over please to John's Gospel. John's Gospel chapter 20. John's Gospel chapter 20. And just at the end of that chapter. John chapter 20 and verse 30. And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life through his name. And it's really just that last verse that I want to think about, but these are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you might have life 
through his name. Back please in John's Gospel to chapter 5. John chapter 5. And we're roughly about halfway through the chapter this time. Verse 24. John chapter 5. Verse 24. The Lord Jesus is speaking. He says, Verily, verily, I say unto you that he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life. And then finally, please, the book of Revelation, second last uh, chapter, sorry, third last chapter, chapter 20. Revelation, the last book in the New Testament, and chapter 20. And we're looking just about halfway through the verse, three quarters of the way through the verse, verse 11. Revelation 20, verse 11. And I saw a great white throne and him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged out of those things which are written in the books according to their works. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it. And death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them. And they were judged, every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So those last two verses that I really want to consider the, uh, this, uh, tonight. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And I'm sure the Lord will bless what we've read this evening and our thoughts upon it. An expression which no doubt you have heard is, get a life. We were on holiday just a couple of weeks ago now. Seems like an eternity ago since we were back. But we were on holiday and there was an argument happening um, between a family and the comment was made, get a life. And as I was thinking of this, it brought me to think of, what is a life? And it thought me to, it drew me to think of other expressions that we've no doubt heard, and they follow a similar theme. He's got a life. Or maybe some more that's one that's known and referenced as, he's no got a life. Well, as I was thinking of that as, what is a life? If someone's to go get a life, what are they to go and get? Where do they get it from? What's the basis of it? What's the foundation for it? What's its source? What's the supply? And you know, the answer to that generic statement of get a life is there is no statement. There is no foundation to that life. There is no real source of what that life is. It's a statement that's used and really just it compares with nothing. Go get a life. And the question really then begs if we are told to get a life, what do we get? What does it mean? What is it expected? I thought then as I was thinking of this meeting this evening, I was thinking, you know, the Bible tells us to get a life. But it tells us exactly what life to get, how we can get it, where it's found, and what its source is. And I want to look at four expressions tonight that I hope will cause you to consider whether you have a life or not. I want to look at them in the order I've read them. I want to think about a given life or someone who gave a life. I want to think of have a life, John chapter 20. I want to think of get a life, John chapter 5. But then I want to think in Revelation chapter 20 of that expression which I've already alluded to, no life. And that's quite a sobering thought when we get to that at the end of our meeting as we think of that no life. But what about this, give a life? Well, Matthew chapter 20 and verse 28 says, The Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give his life a ransom for many. There's a life given. He gave a life. But you might say, well, hold on a minute. What do you mean? Well, the Lord Jesus Christ tells us here, came not to be ministered unto. You might wonder, what does that mean? Well, it means just to serve. The Lord Jesus Christ, when he came into this world, he didn't come to be served, but he came to serve. Now, you might look at the Lord Jesus. You could trace some of the things that we have recorded for us in the New Testament. Things concerning the Lord Jesus. And John would tell us that all things were made by him. 
and there wasn't anything that made uh, that, that was made that is made well, apart from him. And so you could say, well, if the Lord Jesus Christ is that powerful uh, and he's the maker of the universe, then he's right to be served. You could look at the Lord Jesus and you could find that no matter where he went, no matter what he did, he was righteous and he was just. And you could say, well, he would make a great judge if he's going to be honest and true and righteous. And that would be the case. And you could have said that he could be a judge. But you could also look and see that he was faithful, he was upright, and you could say, well, he could have made a king. And that would be true. And you could say that the Lord Jesus Christ could have been a king because of all these characteristics, but he didn't come to be a king. He didn't come to be a leader or a prestigious judge as they were in those days. And he didn't come to be this proud, pompous, set-up man. This verse tells us that the Lord Jesus came not to serve, not to be served, but to serve. And that takes it from almost one extreme to another extreme because instead of being the one being served, now you can think of it in, you, in, in the pictures that you see of the olden days. There was servants and there was all sorts of things happened for those who were served. There was servants galore underneath them. There was uh, all the privileges of the day were given to them. Uh, and that would be right to give them to the Lord Jesus for who he was. But he didn't take any of them. Instead, he was the one who became the servant. He was there to serve the people he was amongst. We have recorded for us, and it's one of these lovely ones we think about, where the Lord Jesus put a towel around his waist and he washed the disciples' feet. A picture of a servant. You know, there are many people who wouldn't even have done that in their own houses. As the master of the house, they would have left it to the servants to wash the feet. Now, you might think washing a feet, that's not really something that we do, and it's not. But in those days, with sandals and probably bare feet, not socks and sandals, just sandals and bare feet, you would get mucky feet. And it was seen as a, a mark of respect to wash a person's feet. But the master of the house would never do that. And yet we can find the Lord Jesus, and he has a towel around his waist, and he's washing the disciples' feet. And there are many examples we can see of this, and how the Lord Jesus Christ came, and he was a servant to those around him. He served those by healing them. He served those by uh, proclaiming miracles. Uh, and there are lots of things that we can look at. We don't have the time to go through them all. But we can see here that the Lord Jesus Christ came to serve. But his greatest service was that he paid a ransom. And you say, well, what's a ransom? Well, I'm sure you've seen films or read books or stories or newspaper articles about somebody who's kidnapped and a ransom needs to be paid. There is a price that is required to be paid paid in order for freedom. And the Lord Jesus Christ says here that he gave his life a ransom. That means there's a price had to be paid. And you might say, well, how much? Well, the problem we have in the how much is that quite simply this. In our minds, we work on pounds, pennies, or something of that ilk. A value that we place with earthly products, gold, silver, or precious metals. But when it came to this ransom that was required, it was a price that God required. It was a price that God required to be played, paid, and it wasn't in silver or gold, and it wasn't in precious metals or stones. The price that had to be paid could only be paid in blood. But it wasn't just any blood. You see, all the animals that had been slain, when Moses gave the offerings and the sacrifices that had to be made, all these animals were slain and their blood was shed, but none of that was the value that God required. But this man, the Lord Jesus Christ, he gave his life. He paid the price that was required with blood. The Bible tells us that God was satisfied with the price that was paid, with the ransom that was paid by the Lord Jesus Christ at Calvary's cross. And this was his greatest service, was him going to a place called Calvary, was him offering himself upon the cross, and they are paying the price that was required for our ransom. And I say our ransom because it's your ransom and it's my ransom. We are held to ransom by sin. Sin controls our lives and it demands of all the things that we do. But the price that was required to set us free from that is what was paid at Calvary's cross. A ransom that was paid. And because the price was paid, there is now eternal life. You may have caught that theme as I was singing uh, these hymns that I had chosen as we were going through the reading. It was thinking of that life. Uh, and getting a life is what I thought my theme was. Uh, and so there is now eternal life available. 
because the Lord Jesus Christ has paid the price required at Calvary's cross. And so the Lord Jesus Christ, he has come and he has given a life and the ransom is paid. But you might follow my thread here as we go along. So we now have eternal life available, but how can we have it? Or can we have it? Maybe is the question that's asked. Can we have it? Well, John, we read there in John chapter 20, almost at the end of John's gospel, John writes these words and records these words for us. And he says, And many other signs truly did Jesus in the presence of the disciples which are not written in this book. Now, I don't have the time to go through all of John's gospel and pick out the words that he says, the actions that he did, the miracles that he did, the, the healings that he did, and all these things. But you take your time and go through John's gospel and read them. And John's telling us here that there's actually a lot more that did happen but are not recorded for us. There's another part of Scripture that says if all the words, all the actions could be written or were written that could be written. Even the world couldn't contain the books of it all. Such is the vastness and the greatness of the ability of the Lord Jesus. But what he does say in verse 31, he says, but these are written, that is what is recorded in John's gospel. These are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And that believing you might have life through his name. So we know that the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross at Calvary, but we have to accept that Jesus is the Christ and that he is the Son of God. You see, it's no point in accepting that there was a man who died on Calvary's cross, but he was just a man. The point is that the Lord Jesus Christ who died on the cross at Calvary was sent by God. He was sent uh, into this world that he might go to a cross at Calvary. And because he has died there at the cross, and if we believe that, then we can have life. Now, you might say, well, where are you going with this, Gordon? Well, in our house, very often, I have a little child, or one or two of them, who come to me and say, can I have? Of course you can. That doesn't mean to say they get it. You see, there's two things to that. Can you have is, do I have the ability to be able to have it? Do I have the right to have it? That doesn't always say that they get it. But I want to think about it like this. As a sinner, I can ask, is it possible for me to have salvation? Is it possible for me to have eternal life? Well, John tells us here, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, sent by God into this world, and dying upon a cross, then believing you can have eternal life. And... It's as easy as saying that. You know, what I noticed about this as well is it says that these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is, Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that the good people might have life. No, but it doesn't say that. Neither does it say, and the charitable can have life. Neither does it say, and the religious can have life. There are many good people out in our world. There are many charitable people in our world today. And there are many religious people in our world today. Religion has an awful lot to answer for in our society of today. But that's not what John says. John doesn't say that you have to meet a certain criteria in order to have this life. It doesn't say that you need to achieve a centered standard to have this eternal life. It doesn't say that you have to attain to a certain part, religion, sect, group, or whatever it might be. What John says is this. If you believe it, and it is anyone who believes it, then you can have eternal life. And it's offered, and it's free, and it's available because the Lord Jesus Christ is the Son of God and it was him who went to the cross at Calvary. And we can have that life if we believe that. And you might say, well, okay, Gordon, I understand now. You've told us that we can have eternal life because the Lord Jesus Christ died on the cross. And that's because he gave his life. And I can have it because it's open to anyone who believes. But how do I get a life? Well, we read that in John chapter 5. John chapter 5 says the words of the Lord Jesus as he's speaking. And he says, Verily, verily, I say unto you, He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me 
hath everlasting life. I looked that word up. It is translated somewhere else in another version. It says, him that be- him, uh, believeth in him that sent me gets everlasting life. You see, there's a bit of a difference in that word hath and gets. In our understanding of English, gets is something, de- it's something determined, something that is guaranteed, that gets. Hath is maybe just in a way, an old English way of thinking there's a, maybe a, a doubt or a hindrance in there. But no. What the, what the, the, the scriptures here is saying is, what, the, what the, uh, the Lord Jesus is saying, as John has recorded for us, he that heareth my word and believeth in him that sent me absolutely gets eternal life. We can say, how do I get that? Well, he says, he that heareth my word. And you might say, well, I can't hear his word. He's not here. Ah, but you can hear his word. The fact that you're here listening to the gospel and read, listening to these verses that I've read from the Bible, these are his words. They're not my words. These are his words. The words of the scriptures, the words of the Bible, are the words that were inspired by God and men wrote them down so that we could have them. We could have God's words written for us so that we can understand. And again, I could go through John's gospel and pick out some of the expressions, some of the statements, some of the things that are made uh, are proclaimed in there that would teach us some of the things that God has said, some of the things that the Lord Jesus Christ explained. But you know, I want to just highlight them. Very high level, some of these things that are said. Not just in John's gospel, but in the rest of the Bible. You know, we thought last week, we thought about an expression that's found in Romans, all have sinned. And you might say, well, I've only a little sin. That doesn't matter. It's a sin. During a lockdown, one of the science experiments that was done was to put some food dye colouring into some water. You put one drop in, and the water changes colour. You know that principle applies for sin. You do one sin, and that's that the whole lot changes colour. You see, we might say, well, I'm not a bad sinner. It doesn't matter how many sins you've done, how big the sins you've done, or how bad the things you've done. The Bible says that you are all sinners. But he tells us that there was one who was willing to die, a lamb provided by God. And John the Baptist could say, behold the lamb of God. What about him? Who taketh away the sin of the world. And you see, the Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, and we've thought of this already, but he came into the world that he might go to the cross at Calvary. But why? That he might take away your sin. That he might take away my sin. That he might give us eternal life. That he might give us, that he might offer for us salvation from our sins. There's another verse in the Bible that says, repent and believe the gospel. I wonder how many of us are willing to repent. Do you know, human nature tells us that we don't. Human nature has us that we stick to our guns. Society would breed that within us as well in many respects. It's not my fault, it's somebody else's. But you know, as we stand before God, as we stand separated from God, we can look back into the Garden of Eden and we can discover that a man and a woman in the garden, in fact, we had this conversation the way back up the road in the car, uh, nine hours is a long time to drive, but the conversation started and uh, as part of the conversation it was this, what if Eve hadn't eaten of the fruit? What if Adam hadn't eaten of the fruit. You see, it stems back to this. Way back in the Garden of Eden, Adam and Eve both sinned. They both disobeyed God. And we could speculate about what if. There's no point because it happened. And what we can't change is what Adam and Eve did. But what we can change is where we spend eternity. And Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden. And because of that, throughout all the generations that have passed thereby, we're all marked by sin. And if we are separated from God, as Adam and Eve were sent out of the garden, as we are separated from God by sin, God is righteous. God is holy. God cannot stand sin. I use the analogy a lot, and I'm going to use it again. God loves us, even although we are sinners. But God hates our sin and can't stand it. The analogy I use for that is the dentist. I don't particularly like going to the dentist. Not that I have a personal problem with my dentist, but rather what she does inside my mouth. 
And you see, God loves us. He doesn't like what we do. He doesn't like the sins that we do. But he still loves us as a person. And we are separated from God. Sin has tarnished our lives. Sin rules our life. And if we want to get back to God, if we want to get right before God, if we want to have our sins forgiven, that we might get into the presence of God and get back with God, then we have to come with repentance. We have to come seeking forgiveness. There's something else we're not very good at as humans, is it? Forgiveness. But the Lord Jesus Christ has promised that he will forgive us our sins. The psalm tells us that he will forgive us our sins as far as the east is from the west. You, know, you can track the north and the south. It's very key. I don't know whether you're interested in space or not, but I'm quite interested in space. And it's very easy to track the north and the south. In fact, it's critical for tracking the north and the south poles of our world, of our globe, in order to track space. But we can't really track the east and the west. Because if you travel from the east to the west, you will always find there's another point that's east and west furthest from you. And the point of that psalm is this, that the sins that we have, if we are forgiven of our sins, then they are taken away so far that they can never come back to us. And so we are required to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. He that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me can guarantee that you will have everlasting life. That is salvation. That is forgiveness of sin. That is to have your sins forgiven forever and never have to face the judgment that God requires. And you might say, well, how does God require judgment? Well, you just look at your childhood or look at children around about you. If they do something wrong, they're expected punishment. I suppose society would try and erode that in many respects in our life today. They would try and say, well, there's a tolerance and we can accept a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But God is not a, a man who shifts his values or his standards and God requires perfection. Well, you can't attain to that perfection, neither can I. And if we haven't trusted and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, then there is a requirement to face God's judgment. In fact, at the end of the verse, it tells us that. He says, He that heareth my word and believeth in him that sent me hath or gets, guarantees everlasting life, and shall not come into condemnation, but is passed from death unto life. You see, God requires a price paid. If it's not the price of the cross of Calvary, it is judgment that will be paid. And if it's not that we have trusted and believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, there will be judgment for eternity. Condemnation. And so, the Bible tells us here that if we trust and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, him that believeth on, the Lord Jesus, on him that sent me, on the Lord Jesus Christ, on the price that was paid as a ransom at Calvary's cross, by the one who gave his life. And by the offering that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ, by believing that he is the Son of God, sent into this world, we can have everlasting life. We can have eternal life. Then by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, we will get everlasting life. But as I've just thought there, there is the, op there is the alternative to that. And that is that there is condemnation. And that leads very nicely into our last little point in Revelation. Revelation chapter 20 is a very sobering uh, chapter. Uh, and written there, and we read of it this evening, of a great white throne. And there are those who stand before that throne. There's a book that is opened. Rather, there are books that are opened. Do you know there is, perhaps there was, a book with your name on it? I don't know how good an author I would be. But there is a, a book that, is, that was written with my name on it. And in that book was recorded every single sin that I ever done. Whether that was a thought that nobody knew about, whether that was an action that nobody ever saw, or whether it was those things that people heard or saw or saw me do or heard me speak, every single one of them was recorded down in that book. But then my name was written in another book. And we read of that book. It's called the Book of Life. My name was written in that book, and the book that was written with all my sins in it was destroyed. And my question is, I wonder if there is a book with your name on it, or if there is a book with your name in it. And you may say, well, what, what, what's the point of this? Well, my last point was not about giving a life. 
or not about having a life, or not about getting a life. But my last point was having no life. Verse 14 says, and the death, uh, sorry, and death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. Now, if there's death, there's no life. But then it goes on to say, and whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. If death and hell were cast into the lake of fire, and that was the second death, then the people who were not found written in the book of life were cast in with a second death as well. Cast into the lake of fire. And you see, what, what John was recording for us was the judgment that will come if we haven't trusted and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. You might hear someone say, oh, that person's got no life. They have no life. It's very often used in the context of someone who has gone through particularly trying and difficult circumstances. Perhaps it's family orientated. Perhaps it's looking after somebody or caring for somebody. And the statement's made of there's no life. Well, no more fitting a statement could be made. Regards eternity spent in the lake of fire. They will have no life. There will be torment. There will be agony. There will be suffering. But it's not just for a period of time. It's for eternity. There is no escape from the lake of fire once you're there. There is no escape. There is no respite. There is no return from that place called the lake of fire. And if you have not trusted and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Bible tells us this will be your destiny. No life. I want to warn you tonight, as the Bible would give me authority to do so, that that is the prospect for anyone who does not trust and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There is opportunity for men and women and boys and girls to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and not have to face the judgment of God. Not have to face the lake of fire with no life. But that requires your response. That requires you to think, to consider your life, to consider your sin, to consider the price that was paid at Calvary's cross. I don't know, perhaps you're thinking in your own mind and saying, well, that seems an awful long way, that lake of fire. Seems like it's going to be too far away. Well, perhaps it does seem like that to you, but what I can tell you is this, that the Bible tells you that the only time you can guarantee is now. You know, we like to think about making plans for tomorrow. We were just talking just earlier on today, we've made plans for a week tomorrow. But we might never see that day. Perhaps you've got plans for holidays later in the year. Perhaps you've got plans for tomorrow morning. The Bible doesn't tell me I can even guarantee you tomorrow morning. But the Bible does tell you I can guarantee you now. And the opportunity is offered to you. There is life available. There is eternal life available. There is the offering made to you. The Lord Jesus Christ has died to be able to make salvation available for you. And, and the Lord Jesus Christ came into heaven, from heaven rather, into earth and offered salvation to anyone. Not just those who are religious, not just those who are charitable, not just to those who are good, but to everyone. And you can get salvation by trusting and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. By accepting that you need your sins forgiven. By accepting that you're guilty before God. And trusting in the finished work of Calvary's cross. Knowing that the price that's been paid has been paid that you can go free. And it would be a joy if you would realise tonight that you can avoid the judgment of God. The lake of fire. The second death. It is a joy for those of us who are already saved to know that that will never be our portion, that though that we will never have to face this lake of fire nor the judgment of God. But it could be your joy tonight if you trust and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. I started with a statement, get a life. And that statement in the world, that get a life, doesn't really mean anything because there is no benchmark in which to compare it to apart from your, maybe your own thoughts. But as far as the Bible is concerned, get a life, eternal life, life procured, made, available by the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, you don't really have to do an awful lot to get it. 
Simply trust and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. There are many religions, there are many sects, there are many groups out there in the world and they will require you to do numerous things in order to attain to whatever standard or value they have. But the Lord Jesus Christ has done it all. He's completed the work and all you have to do is accept it and accept the Lord Jesus Christ and you will know your sins forgiven and you will avoid the judgment of God in the lake of fire. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Let's just pray.